Hi everyone. In this video, we're going to go through section 1.10, linear models in business, science, and engineering. And we get three additional um, s examples of how we can apply use matrices to address real life um, scenarios. And the first one deals with uh, weight loss diets. There was a, a diet popular in the 80s, uh, the 1980s called the Cambridge diet based on a, a, a scientist from Cambridge University that analyzed data. Um, and it was a low calorie diet with like a powdered formula that contained certain amounts of various, uh, you know, vitamins and minerals and all that. And so we can kind of use that concept, but on a much smaller scale than that scientist did to find some, in this example, some combination of milk, soy flour, and whey to get the exact amounts of protein, carbohydrates, and fat supplied by the diet, the Cambridge diet, in one day. And so the way that we want to kind of think about this and how we connect all of this to linear algebra, now clearly it looks like a matrix already. It's set up in that rectangular grid. Uh, but the way that we're going to think about this is we're going to say that we have x1 units of non-fat milk, for example, to start with, x1 units of non-fat milk, and that is our scalar, and we are multiplying that by uh, the nutrients per unit. Nutrients per unit of non-fat milk. milk. Okay. So, and that, that nutrients per unit of nonfat milk is our vector. Okay, so we still have uh, scalar times vector as we have throughout this entire chapter, right? The x1, x2, and x3 are what we are going to solve for, with x2 being our, the soy flour and x3 being the amount of whey, all with the goal of getting the correct amount of protein, carbs, and fat in the Cambridge diet, okay? So uh, that's that's conceptually what's going on here. Um, ultimately, in terms of, of uh, answering the question, um, it's the same setup, right? We're gonna take that uh, grid above and write an augmented matrix, 36, 50, whoops, 52, zero, 51, 34, and seven, 13, 74, 1.1, augment that with how much we need for this Cambridge diet. So that's what the setup looks like. I'm not going to go through the row operations. You should take this as an opportunity to see if you can put your matrix in reduced row echelon form um, efficiently on your TI-89s. But this one does reduce to the identity on the left and on the right hand side decimal point 277, decimal point 392, and 233, like that. And so our solution, which I'm not going to write down, is that the diet requires 0.277 units of non-fat milk, 0.392 units of soy flour, 0.233 units of whey. And those are like the ratios that will give us the desired, the, the, the protein, the carbs, and the fat that we want in our diet. Okay. And just before moving on to the next example, one thing to um, think about, and I'll write it at the bottom here, what is the significance What is the significance of all positive solutions? Okay, so now that I've got that written down there, pause the video, think about that for a second. So it's necessary, or it's it, the, it's significant that all those solutions are positive, so that there is an actual, physical possible solution, right? If you had a negative uh, amount of whey, that wouldn't make sense. You couldn't construct that Cambridge diet; it wouldn't work. Okay, so that's what we're saying. Because we have all positive solutions, we actually have a solution here. Our second example involves uh, an engineering application in dealing with electrical networks. Um, current flow 
is something in, in electrical networks that can be described with a system of linear equations. If you've taken some, some engineering courses in the past, or maybe a chemistry course, oh, probably not chemistry, uh, but you may have seen uh, Kirchhoff's law. I'm not sure if I'm saying that correctly. V equals R times I. The algebraic sum of Ri voltage drops in one direction around a loop equals the algebraic sum of the voltage sources in the same direction around the loop. That is what the law states. Um, even if you haven't seen this in the past, um, we can still uh, analyze the, the image and, and, set, and represent and set up a system of linear equations. I probably won't do the science justice, um, leave that to your engineering professors, but I'll just take you through how we translate this into a system of linear equations, okay? To start the problem, we're gonna focus ourselves just on the first loop here. And things to notice in the, in the first loop, um, up here, this area represents the battery. This is the longer side of the battery. So the current in this first loop is flowing from the positive, which we de designate as the longer side of the battery, positive side of the battery, counterclockwise around to the negative, shorter side of the battery, okay? And that is a, a positive direction, or the, the voltage is positive in this case. In a later loop, it will be negative. All right, and so what we do is we're going to um, add the three resistors. Okay, so we have three different resistors. Let me highlight that or circle them with a different color. This is one, two, three resistors. Okay, and so on the 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 left hand side of our first equation for loop one. Let me write this as loop one. Loop. One, the left-hand side of the equation is adding those three resistors together for I1 plus oops, plus another four I1 plus four I1 plus three I1, and that is equal to 11 I1. Okay, so that's the, the current on loop one. The only thing is there is also a part of loop one that it shares with loop two, okay? They, they both share that three ohm resistor, okay? So in our first equation, this much is 11I1. That's just part of the first equation, all right? Um, we're gonna take that 11I1 and subtract three I2 because that three uh, ohm resistor is shared with the second loop, it gets a negative in front of it, and the I subscript 2 is because it's on the second loop, all right? And that is going to equal the total current in there, the total, excuse me, voltage in the system, which is equal to 30 volts, okay? That's the first loop's equation, all right? So we'll do the same thing now for the second loop, which I'll highlight with a different color. There we go. There's the my coloring for the second loop, loop. Two. All right, what do we got going on there? So we add up what's on loop two first. We have uh, one ohm, two ohm, three ohms, four, five, six ohms on loop two. So there's going to be a positive six I two. And I wrote that in the middle intentionally because loop two also shares that three ohm resistor with loop one. So it gets a negative three I one. And it also shares a 1 ohm resistor with loop 3. So that gets a negative I3. Total voltage in the system is equal to 5. Okay. Now we have one more loop. And my highlighting is getting a little crazy, but we'll go with it. Uh, let me make this last one. We'll use yellow again. This last highlighting yellow. So I'm looking at loop 3. Okay, and first I want to add up what is on loop three. So let me write loop three. Draw another line there. There we go. So I see one ohm, two ohms, three ohms. So that is a positive three I three on loop three. It also shares a resistor, this one, with loop two. So that's a negative one I two. 
okay? And then the total current on, or the total voltage on that system is 20 down here and five up there. So it equals 25, but wait, there's more. What I want you to look at here is, I'm gonna go back up to the first one, see my little red highlighter there, okay? That was positive counterclockwise around to negative. Down in loop two, there's positive counterclockwise around to negative. In loop three, here's positive, the longer one, clockwise around to negative on the battery. So it's just something to, to kind of look for, to check for, and what that means um, for the voltage is that the 25 is a negative 25. So let me write my three equations kind of closer together now to kind of sum all this up. We have 4i, no not 4, 11i1, 11i1 minus 3i2 equals 30 negative 3i1 plus 6i2 minus i3 equals 5 and negative i2 plus 3i3 equals negative 25. If you go through the row operations or set this up as an augmented matrix and go through row, row operations, you yield the solution that I1 is equal to 3 amps. I2, that's a positive 3, that's an equal sign. There we go. I2 is equal to 1 amp. amp. And I3, I3 is equal to negative 8 amps. Okay, that is the answer to that one. If you look in the book, they give you a little bit more uh, in-depth understanding of this engineering application. I encourage you to go and read that. It's on page 84, but that's as much as I'm going to go through for this problem in the video. And the third and final example that we'll look at in section 1.10 is something called difference equations. You'll see difference equations in, in, in ecology, economics, engineering, and they are, you know, the way that we model how things change over time, okay? And so what we see in this example is kind of visually, um, we have a, a scenario where 95%, that's the 0.95 over there, of the people that live in the city stay in the city, okay? And then this arrow here represents 5% of the people that live in the suburbs, or excuse me, that live in the city move to the suburbs from one year to the next. Over here, 97% of the people that live in the suburbs stay there year to year. And then 3%, and this arrow should point to the left, 3% of the people that live in the suburbs move to the city from year to year. So that's like the scenario that we are looking at. And then given that, what we can do is we can um, set up a matrix, something called a migration matrix, and model uh, how these populations can change and will change over time, okay? So our migration matrix, what that looks like, okay? Migration matrix. Okay, we're going to say M for migration. It's going to be a nice little 2x2 two two matrix. And this is important. The 95, the 0.95 goes there, and the 0 0.05 goes there. So this is, here we go, from is up above, and 2 is on the side from the city, from the city, C-I-T-Y, to the city. C I I can write today T Y from the uh, city to the suburbs. Okay, see how that hopefully makes sense. From the city to the city. From the from the city to the suburbs is down there. All right. Hopefully I've handled that. I've explained that okay. And now from the uh, suburbs to the city, that's our point zero 0.03. So the 97 does not go up there because that's the people that are going from the suburbs to the suburbs, okay? So that's how we set up our migration matrix. And now we can use that to model population growth or change over time, okay? In the example, we're got, we've got the population in 2014 is 600,000 in the city, 400,000 in the suburbs. And what we're gonna say is that that is our 
initial vector, x naught, 600,000 and 400,000. And we need to find what's happening in 2015 and 2016, assuming that this pattern holds year to year in this made up city. All right, so that's our 2014 population. 2015, we're going to say is x1. And 2016 is x2. All right, and the way that you find those subsequent years is we use matrix vector multiplication. So I'm going to write this matrix, migration matrix down. 95, 05, 03, and 97. And we multiply that by our population vector. Just like that. And if you do that multiplication, use your calculators, do it out. You have 582,000 up top, so that would be the, the, the people that live in the city at the end of the first year, and 418,000 there. And so if you think about the way that that multiplication works, the 95 and the 03 get multiplied there. So 95% times 600,000 plus 3% of 400,000. Then the 5 and the 97... 5% times 600,000, 97% times 400,000, and those get added together to produce those two values. All right, the last one, we do the exact same thing. Take our migration matrix times the previous answer. So 0 0.95, 0 0.05, 0 0.03, 0 0.97 times the previous answer, and 418, and that produces populations in the city, 565,440, and the other one is 434,560 in the suburbs. So this is our city population, and this is our suburb population. Okay, and so that's um, how that type of problem works. You'll see a couple of these in the homework. Um, they, Like I said, you, you set up that migration matrix and then it's just vec matrix vector multiplication from there on. All right, that is the end of this section. Oh, before I let you go, I forgot. Um, the question that I would want you to think about is what happens as time progresses? To the, what happens if this model stays the same in 2018, 2020, 2040, right? Does the city population keep decreasing down to zero and the suburbs increase to all million or so people? That's something to, to think about. Okay, that was all I wanted to say. Thank you for listening. Have a wonderful day. Let me know if you have questions on this content.